Hey everyone, welcome to uh, the EMS Academy. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician in Hopkins. I'm an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, Baltimore County, and I'm honor serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack, medical director's office, the EMS office, Chief Nats, Captain Lenny Stewart, thank you for what you guys do. Thank you for your dedication uh, to lifelong learning. A big shout out to Ashley Brooks, as she is a young member at Pikesville, she is helping us with our Zoom platform. And Ashley is also the one who will put in the chat later in this training, uh, a link, click on the link, fill out some information, get your MIM CEUs. So please keep an eye out on the chat. That'll be coming uh, later uh, towards the end of the training. So I could not be more excited to have our two speakers tonight. Uh, we have uh, Sam Meyer-Levy, Sam began uh, her volunteer work for Megan David Adam, the Israeli Red Cross Emergency Services and EMT in 2015. Prior to this, she served two years in the Israeli Defense Force. Sam joined Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in 2017, eventually served as a second EMS <laughs> lieutenant for two years. She received her RN license in 2020, became CCRN certified in January of 23, and has worked primarily in ICU settings. She currently works in the trauma ICU of Vanderbilt University Medical Center, a level one trauma center. We also have with us Dr. Nikki Austin. Dr. Nikki Austin is a, a frequent contributor to the EMS Academy. Thank you, Nikki. Dr. Austin has been an EMS provider since 1975 and an RN since 1984. Areas of specialization have been adult critical care, including cardiac surgery, trauma, and pre-hospital air and ground transport. She's been an EMS provider in multiple states as an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company. Dr. Austin is an associate professor in the Department of Nursing at Towson University. She is certified in emergency nursing and nursing education. Ladies, thank you for being with us. We super appreciate you, Dr. Austin. Hey, everybody. So, um, uh, so I just have a little little caveat for how we came up with this class, and that is in the fall. I think <clears throat> Sam and I were riding on a on a call with a couple of other people, and we had some call that involved a triad, and I don't actually remember which one it was, but we thought it would be fun to do this class. So we've been thinking about it since last fall. So what we hope to really provide for you is um, some information on some things that you're likely to see in your practice, what your assessment skills would look for in those, and we'll talk about some patient's care situations that you might have had or might have in the future and some important things. So we hope that you jump on board. Um, we're gonna hope to be proficient at monitoring the chat box when each other is doing a little conversation. If you have questions, please just jump right in there. And if you have other scenarios that you wanna talk about, feel free to, to do that as well. I'm gonna try and be proficient at like advancing the screen. Oh, yay, there we go. So um, so we just have um, a few objectives that we wanna, we wanna cover. We wanna talk about Beck's triad, the trauma triad, Cushing's triad, and because there are multiple Cushing's thing, I threw in there Cushing's syndrome and the Verkhouse triad for, um, we'll talk a little bit about DVTs and those. So we'll talk about those implications for EMS providers. So the first one up for us is Beck's triad. So I'm going to turn this over to Sam, and she's going to tell us about that. Yeah, so Beck's triad um, is, as you can see, associated with cardiac tamponade. What is cardiac tamponade? It's a buildup of fluid, blood, or air around the pericardial sac. So for us EMS folks, we'll primarily see this with blunt or penetrating trauma. Um, now... You can also, it can also lead to heart failure. So using the chat box, why is this gonna to lead to heart failure? Shock or death, like just throw some things out there. I like to interact with everybody. So it's gonna be a lot easier if y'all um, use the chat box, talk to me and tell me what you think. Um, why do you think cardiac tamponade is gonna to lead to heart failure? Anybody? All right, all right, we're a little shy here, that's fine. Uh, Backup of fluid, love it. Yay, thank you, uh, Bradford. Heart can't pump, Danny, thanks a lot. Uh, brilliant, so yeah, the fluid is pretty much um, restricting the heart from being able to pump efficiently and yet blood compressing the heart, not pumping blood, all of that. So definitely gonna see heart failure. Um, 
obviously in the field, we're not, we don't have any CTs, echoes, x-rays. So what's something that you're going to be able to notice uh, with our assessment in the field? It's very simple. You can do it. Okay, how about listening to heart sounds? I'm not sure what POCUS is, but I'd love to hear about it. Muffled heart sounds, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, treatment for this. Please okay. do not go poking anybody's heart in the field. Not uh, advised, not in our protocols. Um, oh, thank you, port of care ultrasound. So um, it would be a pericardiocentesis. So they pretty much take a needle, they, um, they're gonna drain the pericardial sac and that's pretty much how that's taken care of. So where's the triad? All right, let's go next slide. Sorry, that's my, uh, there we go. Okay, okay so um, Dr. Claude back in 19, 1935 um, came up with this and we have three symptoms that we associate with cardiac tamponade. It's hypotension, JVD and muffled heart sounds. So we just talked about the muffled heart sounds. Why are they gonna be hypotensive? So we already talked about what, the heart can't pump effectively, right? So because that heart's not being able to pump as effectively, our pressure is gonna be lower. Um, and then we also have JVD. Why is JVD gonna occur? Because since that heart's not pumping effectively, that fluid's gonna be getting backed up and you'll be able to see JVD a lot more prominently. Um, now, a lot of studies show that there, you, you might not see all three signs at once, um, but at least like for us in the field, we need to just constantly keep assessing our patients. I don't care if you assess them once, you got 10 minutes to the hospital, assess them again. Um, so just always be, you know, taking our vitals, looking at our patients, listening to our patients. Um, all right, let's go on to the next one, Nikki. Oh yeah, this is gonna be, we're talking about JVD. So um, you can see it's a lot easier to um, assess JVD when, JVD when it, they're either semi fallors or high fallors. When they're supine, like the, it's gonna be low venous pressure, so it's not gonna be as prominent. So you wanna make sure that you're gonna be assessing them. Um, um, all right, so let's go to the trauma triad scenario. This is my favorite. Uh, so we're going to go through the scenario, um, and I want you to kind of point out like the three different things that we're going to see in a trauma triad. Uh, if y'all know it, then like definitely point it out. So we have an MVC rollover into a ditch. You, you're on scene. There's a prolonged extrication time. So we have to wait 30 minutes until this patient is actually extricated. You're in the AMBO. Their GCS is 15. They're very agitated. They're hypotensive. They're tacky. They're tachypnic. Cap refills greater than two seconds, their pupils are equal and reactive. You notice lots of different deformities, um, pelvic bruising, you're not sure about their past medical history, you don't know if they were belted. Uh, in about 20 minutes, you know, you're still on scene, you're trying to get leads on, you're trying to get access, um, and uh, their GCS is 11. So they're even more hypotensive, and now they're, uh, they are barely breathing. So what are you thinking? What are your concerns? What are interventions? All right, thank you, Tom. Hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy, that's what we're going for. Okay, so tell me in this scenario, how are you looking for that? So we see at least first their cap refills greater than two seconds, right? So what's that gonna mean? They're hypoperfusing, right? What's hypoperfusion gonna lead to? So we don't have, we're not oxygenating well, right? So we're gonna talk about this in a little later. Acidosis, awesome. Um, and also could see electrical alternates, EKG tamponade. Oh, thanks Dr. V, yeah. Um, what else? What about their breathing? What, why do we not like a uh, decreased respiratory rate? They're gonna accumulate what? We can do it. If we breathe in oxygen and we exhale what? CO2, love it. So acidosis, there you go. Um, so let's start with, where are we going? All right, so let's go, let's move on to our triad. All right, so we're talking about hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. So what happens during hypothermia? We have decrease in blood pressure. Um, 
your cardiac output's going to decrease. You're not going to be perfusing to um, your extremities. Uh, we'll talk about like the three vital organs uh, in a little bit. Um, we're going to have issues with coagulopathy. We're going to talk about lactic acidosis. And then we're going to eventually touch on the diamond of death. If you know it, don't say it yet. We'll save it for the end. Um, so we're going to start with hypothermia. Now, oh, you can go to the next slide, Nikki. So hypothermia is considered to be less than 35 degrees. So who's at risk for hypothermia, right? So we have people that are in hemorrhagic shock, um, TBIs. So interesting with TBIs, uh, this kind of might be a little bit after, you know, your field assessment more in hospital. Um, it's, it's probably more related to, but uh, neurostorming. So people, they're not able to regulate their nervous system as well. And you'll see a lot of changes in vital signs and in temperature assessments. Um, things are just really out of whack. So it's really important that we keep those patients uh, normothermic. Um, alcohol intoxication. We're going to touch on coagulopathy on the next slide with that. Uh, trauma patients that are naked on unpadded backboards. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, uh, burns, you know, what's the biggest organ that we have? Everybody probably knows this. It's your skin, right? So if that, that's all burned off. You're not able to regulate your temperature. Thank you, everybody. Oh, I love it. Everybody who's in the chat. This is fabulous. Um, and then lastly, prolonged extrication and environmental exposures. So uh, one thing I want to note with hypothermia, kind of interesting, a lot of times uh, after like a cardiac arrest, if the person had a shockable rhythm, typically we're supposed to cool them. Uh, at my last hospital I worked at, we, we cooled everybody after cardiac arrest. Uh, now it seems like it's turning more to be uh, instead of being hypothermic, we just want to keep them normothermic, even though we still call the protocol hypothermic, but that's mainly to preserve somebody's brain function after cardiac arrest. Um, so treatment, what are we going to do? So that little picture on the right, I don't know. I, I, I only, I've seen this at, at Vanderbilt. I haven't seen it the, the last place I worked at, but it's called a ranger and it's essentially a, a fluid warmer. You can also use it to, to warm blood as well. It's a little cassette, you slide it in that machine uh, and it warms the blood, warms the fluid, it works great. We also will use what's called a bear hugger. It's, I don't know, probably like knee height. Uh, you place a, what looks like a paper sheet over the patient. You hook this little thing in and it blows warm air into this. And, and then we usually sometimes, if they're really cold, we'll even put plastic around them just to like keep all of the heat in. Uh, it may lead to impaired ability to clot and decrease platelet function. And as we are, we already said, it's going to decrease perfusion. Um, so for this really important to get your patients warm. All right, let's go to coagulopathy. So for coagulopathy, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, don't really stress about the whole clotting cascade. I just wanted to make a point that we're not going to talk about every little step in uh, the cascade. It's extensive, it's complicated, it's above my pay grade. So really what you wanna focus on with coagulopathy is, uh, if, does your patient have pre-existing conditions? Do they have AFib? Are they taking warfarin, heparin, uh, things like that? That's gonna be really, really important to note because then you're gonna find more complications down the road. Do we need to reverse them? Uh, can anybody tell me what the antidote for warfarin is? Get bonus points. Vitamin K. Good job, Carol and Ashley. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this can definitely lead to further hemorrhaging. So we need to get them clotting factors. We need blood products. We need reds. We need platelets. We need plasma, all the good stuff. Um, so this, the cascade, as we said, it, it is going to be disrupted. So with acidosis, pretty much it will accelerate the fibrinogen consumption. So in that blue little box, you see where fibrinogen, um, so for acidosis, that's where it's gonna have an effect on. And then for hyperthermia, it seems like there's not too much understood with exactly how it disrupts the cascade, but there's been a lot of studies that there are negative outcomes um, with it. Now, I recently talked about uh, alcohol. 
So what are, what's the acute and what's the chronic issue with alcohol and coagulopathy? Um, I think the acute issue, we kind of all probably know you get, you know, you're dispatched to a one box in Towson for one of the college folks, they're drunk and this and that. Um, you're concerned uh, that their blood's thin, right, from the alcohol. Now, living in Nashville, I can tell you there have been so many times where even the ages from 20 to 60 year old, they're out on Broadway, they're on these scooters and they fall and they're drinking and they all have head bleeds. So we really need to be careful if we, if the patients are under the influence in some regard, because that's absolutely going to have a very, very negative outcome um, for their, for their plan of care, for their, for their whole process. Um, for chronic alcohol use, what's the issue there? Chronic liver is responsible for clotting factors. Love it. Cirrhosis, dysfunctional liver. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, our liver is responsible for making our clotting factors, right? So when we drink, uh, when we have our chronic drinkers, they have cirrhosis and their liver is not able to create those clotting factors as usual. Um, so that's also really important to note. Um, alrighty, let's move on to acidosis. Okay, so our pH in our blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. Um, and so the question is, how do we come, become acidotic? So the picture on the right, we have the citric acid cycle. Again, this is another uh, example. We're not going to go through the whole cycle. The point is we have aerobic and anaerobic um, cellular metabolism. Um, and that'll be on the next page, but we're going to uh, Krebs cycle. Um, so yes, we got peripheral vasal constriction due to hypothermia and hemorrhage. Uh, this is going to lead to hypoperfusion, right? So we have impaired oxygen delivery. What three vital organs are we going to be perfusing? You guys have been using the chat. Throw any organs out there. I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. Brain. Great, Bradford. Thank you. Brain, kidneys, heart. Awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, that's exactly right. So, um, all the blood's going to be shunting to those vital organs so we can keep those alive and keep those perfusing. Um, we're going to talk about metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. How does somebody become, um, uh, in respiratory acidosis? What is that? We already talked about it. The accumulation of CO2, which a lot of people said earlier. So strong work. And um, we already talked about how coagulopathy can be impaired with acidosis. Uh, does anybody have questions so far? We going through this? Okay. I think y'all are doing really well. Um, so go ahead. We're going to go to the next slide, which is cellular metabolism. And biggest thing is oxygen versus no oxygen. So if you're not if you're not perfusing, you're not oxygenating. You're, you're hypoperfusing and you're, you're building up acids in your blood, essentially. Um, so um, obviously we can't continue aerobic metabolism without that oxygen. So uh, you're going to be building up a lot of lactic acid and that's pretty much what's going to lead to that acidotic state. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? I and mean, it's pretty, I think it's pretty straightforward. I'm not going into the cell cycle. I did that. Nobody wants to look back at that again. No a NADH or, uh, or ATP. All right, let's move on to the diamond of death. So this is, this is actually, I think it's really interesting. Um, this is in a lot of different um, like studies and whatnot. It's not, I mean, it's not like an official thing that's been put out there, but it's been touched on a lot in other classes that I've taken. So when you're giving somebody blood, like when we're giving coolers and coolers and coolers of blood, in those packed red blood cells, there's citrate. Now the issue with citrate is it prevents a binding of an electrolyte. And if you get this, I'll give you brownie points. Who can guess the electrolyte that it prevents the binding of? Don't go Googling it. Calcium, oh, Cynthia, you're awesome. Thank you, Tom, yes. So it's gonna prevent the, the absorption of calcium and your patient's gonna be hypocalcemic very quickly. So that's kind of considered the diamond. So why do we care about hypocalcemia? Um, what, I don't know about Catherine. What is, um, what's it gonna to lead to? Can I just leave them be hypocalcemic and it's not, not a huge deal? 
Yeah, awesome. Cardiac dysrhythmias, absolutely. Um, it could also lead to seizures, muscle spasms, tetany, all that good stuff. So, you know, even though we, we need to get all these products in, there needs to be some kind of afterthought of like, oh, wait a second, where's the calcium at? The other day I had to go to interventional radiology for a patient who we were like constantly just bringing coolers for. And um, we had to slam a few sticks of calcium because uh, he was definitely, definitely tanking. And that was something that like, you, you just can't, you can't, you can't miss. You just have to have to be able to, to think that, okay, all these units of blood, we need calcium. Um, great work. So let's move on to the last scenario for the trauma. Okay, so we have GSW. Uh, we don't know if they're conscious or breathing. So you're staging and dispatched because you're good medics and you gotta be safe. And so uh, dispatch says, all right, uh, AMBA 325, you're clear. So you get on scene, you notice a male is on the ground. He's clutching his abdomen, profusely bleeding. He states he doesn't know who shot him, denies any past medical history or allergies. Um, his GCS is 15, tacky, hypotensive, tachypnic, setting 95% on room air, diaphoretic. And you see there's multiple areas of bleeding from his abdomen. As you're attempting to pack the wounds and reassess the patient, you notice the patient's GCS is now 11. Respirations have decreased. Uh, you're struggling to get an accurate oxygen. I wonder why they're cold, they're hypoperfusing. So what are some things that you're going to do for this patient in the field? Talk to me about your assessments. Talk to me about your interventions. What other, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. Resources are you going to need on scene? Oh, well, you better act quickly because now your pulse ox is reading 86% on four liters of nasal cannula. Cool. Diesel therapy. For people that's not in the EMS field, that's like you're just flooring it to the hospital. Transexemic A, okay, cool. Abdomen is non-compressible wound, okay. All right, what else? What else are you doing with our assessments? Are you doing dressings? Are you putting leads on this person? Are you getting the line? Are you going to intubate, capnography, fluids? Well, I like fluids. Good. I like oxygen. Our patient likes oxygen. All right. He's 87%, but now his GCS is 10. Good. Too bad we can't carry blood in the field. That would be great. We have blood warmers. Oh, this is something I told Nadav, our EMS lieutenant. I want to get a, um, a blanket warmer in the medic. That'd be good. Warming patients prepare for intubation, but ultimately they need blood. Getting them to blood is most important. Beautiful. Yeah. Congratulations. You guys saved the patient. All right. All right, Nikki, let's go on to some IC business. Oh, wait. There should be one after that. Or that's okay. Um, okay. So... All right, so now we're gonna talk about Cushing's triad, another one of the good triads. So this is about uh, ICPs, um, intracranial pressure. So we got, we have a fixed space, right? You got your skull, that's not going anywhere. Uh, but the more stuff you add in there, the increase the pressure is gonna be, and that's kind of what we're gonna be touching on here. So the three um, signs you're looking for in uh, Cushing's triad are bradycardia, um, irregular respirations, chain stokes, and a wide pulse pressure. Uh, if you don't know what chain stokes breathing is, it's essentially you're like hyperventilating and then you're apneic and then you're hyperventilating and then you're apneic. Um, large pulse pressure, wide pulse pressure, you know, 120 over 40. Don't love that. Any, any, any numbers where they just get wider and wider and wider, that's what you're looking for. Uh, so who can tell me what are some signs of increased ICP? Decreased level of consciousness, fabulous. What else? Think about any of your neuro assessments. A whole seizures, okay, good. Pupils, excellent, good. Uh, vital signs, posturing. Don't love posturing. Nobody likes posturing. Late would be posturing, good. Initially change in orientation, right. Now there are, there's different kinds of bleeds. You'll see different vitals change first. Sometimes it's LOC, sometimes it's pupils. So you can't always depend on make on like 
thinking, oh, this person, um, you know, has slurred speech. Now is the time that they're increased ICP. Their one pupil might be not reactive. It, it all depends on the type of bleed and where it's at. Hypertension, bradycardia, nice, yes. Um, Stroke-like symptoms. So um, what do we do for these people? One, you're all in the field. We love our stroke assessments. Always, always, always love a good stroke assessment. And we always need to be reassessing that. Um, you know, whether it's on scene, once you get in the ambulance, when you're en route, when you're at the hospital, uh, things can change real quick. So we definitely don't want to be missing this. One thing I actually should have added, especially with um, our people in the field is what, what's probably like the biggest thing when you get to the hospital, these providers are going to ask you when talking about, let's just say stroke. What's the one of the biggest things? So yes, if they're on blood thinners, anything like that, elevate head of the bed, but what do, what do the docs want to know specifically with strokes onset time last known? Well, yeah, exactly. Um, that's going to be a big, big factor in, um, their interventions. Are they going to be applicable for whether it's like an embolization or a crany, um, or is this something that has been going on for X amount of hours, days that we just can't, can't treat anymore. Uh, so hold on one second. So let's see, I want to just talk about more Cushing's triad. So specifically with, with um, ICPs, um, we talked about, you know, you have an increased brain tissue CSF or blood in the skull, right? Um, in the hospital, in order for us to monitor their ICPs, we'll put in one of two devices. We'll put either a Codman or an EVD. Um, a Codman is literally like a, the tiniest little wire that's going to go into their skull and it just sits there. And we can see a number on the monitor. We like anywhere from zero to 15. If that number is 20 or greater and sustained, we have a big problem. Um, a couple things that we'll do is actually, y'all tell me, how are you going to decrease somebody's ICPs? Consider hyperventilating. Nice. Yeah. What else? Hypertonic saline, yeah. Um, so we'll either give 3% or mannitol. Um, where I, in Vanderbilt, we, we don't ever give mannitol. Usually we only we give a lot more 3%. Uh, the thing with 3% is it's going to change that osmotic gradient and it's going to flush that fluid out. So that's the goal is that we want to decrease the fluid that's, that's in your brain or bicarb due to osmolarity. Um, we want to we want to flush out all of that fluid. Uh, the other thing with mannitol, it's a diuretic, so it, it, you're all going to just pee it out. Um, the other thing with three percent, you have to be careful of, is their sodium. So typically, our sodium we like anywhere between one thirty five and one forty five. Uh, for people that were monitoring their ICPs and giving three percent, we will salt them up to like one sixty or one sixty five, depending on the patient. After that, you know, there has to be other interventions or, or there's no interventions. Um, it just all depends on the patient, the type of bleed, where it's at. Um, sometimes they'll do a crany, sometimes they'll do a burr hole. Uh, now with an EVD, can also do both. Yeah. Um, huh? Twin. Um, now with an EVD, they'll... Uh, it's, it's just like monitoring with a Kahneman, except you have a catheter that's going to sit, uh, in their brain and then it'll drain the fluid off. Uh, and there's some tricky ways to get that fluid to drain off. I'm not going to get super into it, but that's just another thing. So what's another, so besides 3%, besides hyperventilating, what are other really simple ways that we can decrease somebody's ICP? You can think of it. What about, do I want to lie them supine? Do I want to keep the head of the bed up? Keep head of the bed elevated? Yep, exactly. What else? Should I be flickering the lights, playing loud music, constantly poking them? Hey, patient, decrease your ICPs. You want to decrease noxious stimuli, which we, yep, uh, which we kind of don't really help ourselves because we have to check these patients at least every hour. And so a lot of times you have to be very careful because you can just be increasing their ICPs and you don't want to keep them sustained there. So it's a lot of kind of playing with sedation as well. Quiet environment, pain management. Absolutely. 
Um, so you, yes, you need to be careful with your sedation, but you also need to get a good neuro assessment. So a lot of times we'll be kind of communicating with the providers of, Hey, you know, their ICPs are sustaining in the twenties. Do you really want me to turn down sedation to get this assessment? You know, how crucial is one over the other? So that's usually a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, discussion, maintain normal thermic. Yeah. And glucose control. Excellent. Um, Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. All right, Nikki, let's go to our scenario. <laughs> okay, so uh, wife heard a loud bang upstairs and notices her husband's on the ground. You get on scene to a 70 year old male prone on the floor unconscious and has a pulse and he's breathing. His GCS of six, his right pupil is blown, his left pupil is regular and reactive. His heart rate is 100 and irregular. Uh, he's hypertensive and oxygen is 90% six liters, shallow rate at 12. Um, his wife hands you a small basket. She has no idea what's going on. She's freaking out. She doesn't have allergies. She thinks he has a, a heart condition and chronic pain and she thinks he takes his medication as prescribed. Um, these are his meds, Metope, Eliquis, Atorvastatin, Lexapro, Melatonin, and GABA. What is your impression? What should we gather from these meds? Um, what are, what are we going to do? Come on. Yeah, not good. Agreed. Likely head bleed, C-spine to trauma center. Okay. Head injury. Absolutely. But why, why else am I concerned about this head injury? Look at his meds, AFib, exactly. Stroke, head bleed, yeah. So one is heart rates irregular. Yeah, on Eliquis, we're not a fan of that right now. Um, he's on Eliquis and probably is looking like he has AFib. That's why he's taking it and the tope. Um, so we definitely need to be mindful of that. And then what are some other things we're gonna look for? Talk to me about his blood pressure. Nobody's talked about that yet wide thank you tom yes it is wide there's a wide uh pulse pressure um so yeah you're definitely gonna need to get them to stroke center trauma center um and like we said you're gonna reevaluate what happens in the ambulance if that you know left pupil is now blown what if he decompensates to gcs of three and now we need to intubate um so the point is always be reassessing people and um, remember your triads. Um, a little permissive hypertension because we want the percussion to the head greater than 30 degrees. Okay, good. Um, excellent. Thank you so much, Nikki. We're going to move on to the other Cushing's. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a. Uh... So oh, no, they were the they were in a different order. Um, so yeah, let me. I'll touch on the signs of increased. ICPs, we kind of talked about that a little bit. So as I said earlier, uh, it, these, it's not going to, I'm not going to tell you their level of consciousness. You'll see different than the pupils and motor, no, it, anything's game, any order. It all depends on the bleed. We always want to know their, their, their level of consciousness is that are they oriented? Are they confused? Are they baseline confused? Uh, always super important pupil size and reaction. Um, do they have cataracts? What's their, what's their history? Motor function. Do they have any deficits? Do they, did they have a stroke in the past? Um, uh, you know, vital signs we just talked about, um, all the, uh, any other kinds of like, you know, decreased alertness, hemiparesis, headaches, slurred speech. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we touched on a lot of the different, do you guys have any questions about ICPs, monitor, <laughs> triad? If no answer, I will take that as a no. All right, Nikki. Okay, so um, so we threw in a couple of other um, kinds of pictures and scans. Our goal here is not to make radiologists out of any of us, um, but to just look at the effect that some injuries might have um, on a patient and maybe on our assessment as whatever's wrong with that patient gets worse while we're transporting it. You know, our patients don't usually get better from scene two when we get to the hospital. 
So we want to so um, so we want to be you know sort of thinking about those those problems. So this is a great a great picture here because this poor patient has multiple things wrong with the head. So I'm just going to start at the top left where this patient has an epidural hematoma, uh, a bleed on the left side of the head. But the patient also has these circled areas where the patient has bruising or contusions of the brain. <laughs> and then if we look um, down toward, towards the middle, which should be midline, um, that midline um, part of the brain is actually pushed over to the left. So this patient has three different kinds of bleeding or bruising or injury to the head. And what we know about any kind of head injury is, of course, injured tissue will do what? It will swell, right? So we already talked about, you know, your skull is not going anywhere. There's no room inside your skull for either swollen tissue, and, and there are two different sor sources of bleeding for this patient. So would you expect this patient to get better during transport? No. So that's why your serial um, uh, assessments of your patient are so crucial. You can't look inside this patient and see what's happening. You can sort of look at the mechanism of injury, right? And, and sort of anticipate that bad things are happening, but really be mindful of those serial, um, the serial assessments that you do and watch for your patient to, to have worsening uh, symptoms as that increased intracranial pressure gets a little bit higher. So oh, there were supposed to be a few other pictures in here. Sorry, I'm not sure where they went. So we're just going to take a little bit of a, um, uh, a different uh, track here. Uh, we were talking about Cushing, and there are multiple kinds of Cushing. So uh, I actually looked up Cushing today. Dr. Cushing was actually a neurologist who was... Uh, uh, active in wartime, and he was the first one who described the, the Cushing triad from uh, cerebral trauma, um, also the one who really identified these things from Cushing syndrome. So this is really a fat, I'm not an endocrinologist for sure by any stretch of the imagination, but I just want to talk a little bit about Cushing syndrome and our patients who might have this endocrine disorder um, and, and what what Cushing's is. So Cushing syndrome is an endocrine disorder that really results from hypercortisolism or too much cortisol, which is our stress hormone from any cause, regardless of what that is. But we really need to go back and look at what's happening inside this patient's head for a moment. Just think about the hypothalamus. And that the hypothalamus is really like the computer of the brain, uh, which is getting all of this input about all the things that are happening to the patient. So you can just look around this scenario uh, or this, this diagram about issues that we are likely to respond to our patients for. Do any of our patients have pain? You bet. Do we care trauma patients? You bet. How about the bleeding patient? Um, we know we respond to patients who have infections all the time and their patients who are stressed. So we know that the brain and the hypothalamus is getting all of this information from all of these stimuli, and then it's going to respond because the body needs to respond appropriately. So the hypothalamus's job is to then secrete a substance called corticotropin-releasing hormone, which makes this little trick down, um, down to the anterior pituitary in the brain and tells the anterior pituitary, we need more cortisol because we have this really stressful situation, we really need to respond. And so the anterior pituitary secretes adrenocorticotropic hormone, I say that 10 times real fast, and it's gonna tell the adrenal cortex to, um, to secrete more cortisol. Um, so it's important to just take a peek, uh, a look at the anterior pituitary for a moment, and remember that there are multiple kinds of tumors that can um, can also secrete excess adrenocortropic hormone. Um, and that's a little bit different, right? So that patient has some sort of a tumor. If they can take that tumor out, that would be great. But we also need to think about iatrogenic Cushing syndrome and our patients who are receiving long-term glucocorticoid therapy for treatment of some metabolic disorder. 
So iatrogenic means we sort of cause that, right? Um, so the patient is taking some sort of medication to treat some, uh, some medical issue. And now the patient has um, this iatrogenic Cushing syndrome. So what do you think? Um, well, let's just go on to the next slide here. So these are just some actions and effects of, of cortisol. And I'm sorry, I need to pull you up so I can sort of see people here. But so excess glucose metabolism or too high glucose metabolism, you will see this all the time in your ambulance. So does anybody think of a patient who, uh, who is going to, what do we see in a patients who have um, extra glucose metabolism? I don't say extra, but hyper glucose metabolism. What are we going to see in those patients? We're going to do this test probably on most everybody we see. Um, well, before maybe DK, we're just going to see a, a, those raised glucose levels, right? And we're not really talking about a patient who um, who's even diabetic, but patients who had those infections at home, the body's responding to those infections and it is raising cortisol levels and it is raising blood sugar levels in those patients. So we want to be careful, you know, we get on scene and somebody's blood sugar level is 245, 246 or whatever that is. We want to be careful maybe not to mention the word diabetes. We just know that this is an extra response to the stress of being sick or the stress of, um, of whatever uh, trauma that patient might have had. Some of these things take a little bit longer than others um, to really manifest. Um, and we know sometimes we get to patients very quickly after they are injured or ill. Sometimes, you know, they wait to call us. So we might see other problems with glucose. But so cortisol does a few other things. It helps to break down protein, metabolize fatty acids, and it also suppresses that immune system. So our patients are a little bit more susceptible to, um, to infection as they go through. So uh, somebody said nausea. Um, I think um, maybe not so much, but I will think about that as we go through. Um, so this um, emotional stability is really important for, for us to think about when we're on scene of people who are taking high doses of steroid therapy even for short um, short periods of time, because uh, that emotional stability, if you, you can think about all the things that cortisol can do, patients may not be able to sleep well. Anybody react well when you don't sleep well? Probably not. And patients can seem a little bit more on edge, have a little bit more anxiety. So we want to be careful um, not to aggravate those situations. The last one that I think is really interesting and important for us is this. Um, is this permissive effect where cortisol will actually facilitate tissue response to catecholamines when those patients are stressed and that can include those trauma patients. So I want you to think about what that means. What are some of our favorite catecholamines? We have a couple that we love, right? Catecholamine, anybody wanna throw out an answer? One catecholamine that we just love. And that would be our favorite epinephrine, right? So when our patients who are really sick, those cardiac arrest patients, we just love epinephrine. But when patients have that, um, that cortisol, um, extra cortisol on board, it facilitates a tissue response. So they're going to be more responsive to catecholamines during that time of stress. Norepinephrine absolutely is another one. Yeah, so patients on steroids can be quite sick and they just don't have quite the immune system response that we want. So let's go ahead and we're going to talk about, see what our patient on long-term, uh, either steroids or look at those clinical features of Cushing syndrome. So we're on scene, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're looking at our patient who may have, you know, over the course of time developed uh, a number of, of features, some of which may not really impact our treatment or transport very much, but you might see that moon face. I think somebody put that in the chat box. You might see a little bit of that buffalo hump on that patient's um, right above that shoulder and clavicular area, some, some fat pads. Uh, we might see some hypertension in that patient, certainly some tachycardia. I just want to kind of draw your attention to the other, some of these other things like ecchymosis. So look down at this patient's leg 
if you saw that ecchymosis there and a patient didn't report any sign of trauma or injury, what would you think if you saw a few of those on that patient? You know what I might think, but what might you? Yeah, so we might think, well, how did that bruise get there, right? Did somebody abuse that patient? Did the patient have a trauma that then the patient didn't remember, which causes us to think about other things, right? So I'm worried about that bruising, and you might see that in a variety of places. How about osteoporosis? Why are we worried about osteoporosis in our patients? Any thoughts about osteo? We usually think about osteoporosis as that degenerative bone disease, usually in older women. Yeah, these patients are really susceptible to, um, to fractures. They don't have to be traumatized to get fractures. I took care of a patient way back before I, uh, before I was even a registered nurse and we transported her often. She would break bones just by turning in bed because her bones were so fragile from osteoporosis. So we really want to be careful of that and make sure that we're being really careful and not, not injuring our patients. The other thing I just want to point out is that thin wrinkled skin. If any of us are, uh, if we're IV providers, we want to stick an IV in that arm. We need to be really, really careful about that skin and not injure our patient. Even those blood pressure cuffs, the automatic blood pressure cuffs can be, you know, not great for patients with that fragile skin. So if we look down at the bottom, do you see the bottom of the slide where it says pupura? Anybody have any thoughts about what that is? You might see that. What does that mean? Any thoughts? So when we think about petechia and purpura, we think about bleeding. There's some other source of bleeding inside that particular area. So we definitely want to point that out. And I just I want to throw this extra thought out there for you. When you're giving your verbal report, this may not be the presenting thing that they called you for, right? Um, but you want to be able to point out this ecchymosis or anything that's abnormal that you find. Please don't cover it up with your sheets when you're giving a report to the nursing staff because we want to make sure that they see this and it doesn't get sort of lost in our transition of care. So Cushing syndrome, these patients have an awful lot of bad things happening to them potentially. Yeah, more red dots. Yeah, exactly right. So I'm just going to go on and we'll talk for a little bit about Cushing syndrome. I really worry about my patients who are taking long-term glucocorticoid therapy. And imagine for a moment, you know, what's happening to those adrenal glands because we're suppressing adrenal, adrenal glands. And so imagine that patient who, uh, you know, I can think of a number of different things, but maybe the patient didn't do what we hope, and that's gradually discontinue that therapy, because we need to gradually wean off these medications so that the adrenal glands, which have sort of been on vacation while patients are taking these long-term steroid medications, the adrenal glands are on vacation and they may need months to recover. Um, but imagine the patient ran out of medicine, has no medicine, has no way of getting more medicine or forgot to take them for whatever reason. And I've been thinking about those patients in California. If you read any of those stories who are stuck in their houses or, or stuck in their cars in like multiple feet of snow when they can't get out and then we find them. So we may worry about that patient to um, have acute adrenal insufficiency by the time we get them. So we want to look at those vital signs, <clears throat> excuse me, really carefully and look for orthostatic hypotension. What would you find in orthostatic hypotension? If you have an orthostatic patient, what does that mean? <clears throat> Yeah, so that patient has a blood pressure drop and maybe a heart rate increase when that patient moves from a lying um, from a lying position or even a sitting position and goes to stand up. <clears throat> so, has anybody ever been called for a patient who passed out? We get those calls every day, right? The sinkable patient, a patient who passes out for whatever reason. So, these are some things that we. Um, we might want to look at, yeah, a patient gets dizzy, they get lightheaded, that heart rate may go up, unless patients say, can some of those beta blockers 
different positions from uh, a blood pressure from uh, from different different orthostatic positions. Absolutely right. So the patient may also be hyponatremic, or that sodium level may be low, or may be hyperkalemic, and they may be weak. We can't draw blood, certainly. We may be able to put them on an uh, EKG machine and look for some hyperkalemia issues. We really want to encourage these patients, if they don't already have that, that they absolutely need to carry medical alert identification, because if they're not able to speak for themselves, we would have no idea what's wrong with our patients. So I put a scenario here. <clears throat> so this is reasonable. So you're dispatched for a medical emergency on the Baltimore Beltway. You find a 50-year-old male patient who's not feeling well. The patient was, um, was en route from Maine to Florida to enjoy a warm, sunny vacation, which sounds nice today. So the patient is feeling not well, feeling a little bit of weak, weakness, um, has some nausea, and had an episode of diarrhea. The patient has a history of asthma with a recent exacerbation due to COVID, we'll say. That's a great reason to have an exacerbation of any respiratory issue. <clears throat> so the patient was sick for a month, required uh, extra therapy with, uh, with prednisone after <clears throat> um, a week on IV steroid therapy. Prednisone, 40 milligrams a day for a month. That's kind of a lot, but a patient takes albuterol PRM. What's albuterol do? Why is the patient taking that? <clears throat> I know you all know all this. Only BLS providers who can give albuterol now. So it's a bronchodilator, right? A patient takes monolucast, which is a, a leukotriene inhibitor, which is really helpful for helping to prevent um, uh, asthma symptoms. And patient takes Simbicort, which is a, a uh, long-term steroid with uh, some bronchodilator in there. The problem is that the patient forgot to take his prednisone on the trip. Is that reasonable? Sure, patients forget those things all the time. He doesn't remember when his last dose was, but he did leave four days ago. So your vital signs are a blood pressure of 88 over 60 while sitting upright. Um, um, Blood pressure is 120 over 70 lying down. Does that patient have orthostatic hypotension? Yes or no? Yeah, for sure, right? Absolutely. Patient is, patient's heart rate is 110 and regular. And what do you think about 110? Is that high, low, or normal? You all know this. Yeah, it is too high for sure. A respiratory rate of 28, high, low, or normal for an adult. <clears throat> also high, right? And so one of the things I like to sort of go over and you're thinking to yourself, uh, patient has some, ex some expiratory wheezing, patient has uh, temp up 98.6, so we're really not worried about that. Glasgow comb scale is 15 and the blood glucose level is 68. What do you think about 68? <clears throat> Yeah, so, so it's a little low, right? So what are we going to do with our patients, right? So, so what are your thoughts? You're, you're, so you're, 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 by the way, not in the house, right? You're in the patient's car on the side of uh, 695. So what are you thinking here? Let's say if you're a BLS crew, do you want ALS for this patient? <clears throat> yeah, we don't want patients walking. Do you want ALS? So my answer is, um, you know, I'm thinking that I want ALS, right? So we're, certain, we're certainly thinking that we might call ALS. We absolutely don't want to stay on the side of the highway for a long time with this patient. We're not making this patient walk uh, for a long, long way to get to our stretcher, right? We don't want that. Um, and what are some, comp some things that can maybe complicate this issue, the scenario for the patient? Oh, I'm sorry, I just clicked on the wrong screen. There we go. <clears throat> Get off the road, call for ALS. I certainly want to know how, how long it will be till ALS comes. I'm not going to wait a long time for ALS for this patient. If a patient has a reasonable blood pressure lying down, then that's where that patient is going to be, right? Um, do you need ALS? If you can get ALS, great. Patient really needs some IV access. Um, 
think about giving that uh, blood sugar, um, giving some glucose and maybe uh, rehydrating that patient. Absolutely, that can be really helpful. So the things that you wanna give in report, you wanna give that important information and in report about the respiratory issue, Absolutely, that the patient was um, taking this high dose of prednisone, but hasn't taken it for a few days. If I'm the nurse in the emergency department, I certainly want that information before you, before you get there so I can plan accordingly. Is this the patient that you want sitting in the wait uh, with an extended wait time in the hallway? Probably not, right? Okay, good. So let's go ahead. Uh, we're going to talk about Virgas Trio. Next is like one of my favorite things, especially with some of my students. So we see these patients who are at risk for, um, um, for deep vein thrombosis all the time. And so uh, so this, this triad has to do with a patient's ability, not ability, but the patient's risk factors for developing blood clots. And usually we think of blood clots. Where do we usually think of blood clots? You all know this. Where do we think of a blood clot usually that we're worried about? Yeah, in the legs, right? Um, so let's just talk about that for just a second. So we, we might have a patient who has um, venous stasis. Oh, sickle cell crisis. Good for you. Sickle cell um, it, you know, sickle cell crisis results from red blood cells that become sickle shape, and then they get stuck in different parts of the anatomy where they can't get through anymore, and those patients are at risk for, for infarction, wherever that might be. When we talk about this particular triad, we're looking at a patient who has stasis of blood. We know that we don't want blood to clot anywhere in the body. And then when patients don't move, like maybe they're sedentary, um, you know, those would be patients who are sedentary for whatever reason. It might be that they're recovering from an inner illness or an injury and they're just not getting out of bed. Those patients who are bedridden, we see those patients all the time. So those patients are right away at risk for, um, for, for clotting. Patients who have hypercoagulable state, and we'll look at some reasons why that might happen. It might be a patient is, uh, who um, may be smoking, maybe taking some um, um, estrogen kinds of medications, a lot of reasons for that. Um, or maybe a patient who has vessel wall, I have to control exactly right, a patient who has some sort of vessel wall injury. Your blood vessels don't want to be injured and they will react right away. So we're looking for all of those signs where a patient might have stasis of blood, increased blood coagulability and vessel wall injury. Now we can't peek inside there, but maybe the patient has trauma, right? Maybe the patient might have a fracture or is recovering from surgery or any one of those things. We are really worried about the development of a thrombus in a leg, but we can't see what that is, right? We cannot see inside there but we're gonna look at some symptoms that might lead us to think there's a problem. What we're worried about is that thrombus might break off in a vessel and it will travel. So let's just talk about the leg, for example. Maybe we have a patient who has a thrombus in a leg. If that thrombus breaks off, where is it gonna go? <clears throat> Any thoughts of thrombus in a leg, where's it gonna break off? So it's in the venous circulation and it's going to travel up. If it breaks off and it moves and it travels, it's going to go up into the vena cava, right? It's going to go through the heart. I know somebody said heart. It's going to go through the heart, assuming it can get through. It's going to transition out the pulmonary artery. And we think we worry that it's going to get stuck in the pulmonary vasculature and cause a patient to have a pulmonary embolism. Um, so we don't want that to happen. So let's just take a take a peek uh, peek forward. Um, and uh, I found this this really a cool website. Um, I always look for good evidence based information that's really good for patient education on blood clots and where they are. So we definitely worry about blood clots. We're looking at family history, of course. Does a patient have a recent hospitalization? Decreased blood flow. And we've just talked about a lot of reasons why somebody might have increased blood or decreased blood flow. Injury to a vein, maybe a fracture, injury, 
um, severe muscle injury, whatever that cause might be, right? Increased estrogen, maybe from birth control pills or whatever that might be. Uh, chronic medical conditions uh, that predispose the patient um, to developing blood clots um, and age. Of course, anybody can get blood clots. So we don't want to think, that, well, you know, you're not 70 or 80, so you probably don't have one. And that is absolutely uh, not what we want to be thinking, right? So if you look at this picture on the left, uh, you know, and they show the blood clot sort of in the leg, there are different veins where we might see uh, a patient develop a blood clot. I want you to think about, go ahead and reach down to that posterior popliteal area behind your knee, um, you know, the deep veins in your leg. Any patient who has pain there, we're certainly worried about those. We don't want our patient to have uh, PE while we're transporting those. So if we have a patient, you know, one leg larger than the other has some of these risk factors, this is not the patient that we want walking a long way to our stretcher, right? So we're going to take a peek at our assessment here. Um, we're looking at this venous system. Remember, we don't have an ultrasound. Uh, we can't look inside here, but we know we have veins. So we're going to look for a number of things, right? You want to assess both those legs at the same time. You want to look at anterior, posterior surfaces if you can. Does one leg look larger than the other to you? Is the collar in those legs the same? Is a patient wearing socks, stockings, or any other devices? And I, I always get crazy when I'm looking at a patient who's been in the house and they were or some other kind of a healthcare facility. And they're wearing stock stockings or socks, and they're so tight that they're cutting off the return circulation to the to the patient's um, heart. And, and so we have a lot of swelling related to that. And, you know, that's like never good, right? So you want to look at those things, uh, look for discoloration, and assess for pain. If the patient has pain, where is it? I'm not going to spend a lot of time pushing on the legs to see if that hurts the patient, right? I'm just not going to do that. Um, the patient had any injuries or surgeries, EMS, we're looking for pulse, motor, and sensory in those extremities. Hopefully a patient actually has both legs, right? Otherwise you can't really make that assessment. So take a look at this leg. I love looking at this leg. I wish they'd taken a picture of both legs so we could look at both of them together. But, um, I, and I put my chat box kind of at the bottom. I, oh, sorry. There. So, so I can't really quite see my chat box up here there. Let me see if I can get that back. There we go. So I want you to look at this leg real carefully and tell me what you see about this leg that is not quite normal. And are you thinking about it? And we pay, well, honestly, we pick up these patients like all the time. But if you're looking at this leg, what do you think when you're looking at this leg? Edema, good. And it's edema you cannot see that bony structure that you should have, you should see, correct? So it looks like the patient has swelling and you can see the swelling down in the bottom of the foot. You can see it around that ankle. <clears throat> we should be able to see those ankle bones. So the patient has a lot of edema, right? <clears throat> so a patient looks like maybe already missing part of that big toe. And I think you might be right. I actually really don't know. But look up here at the top of the leg. What else do you see up here? at the top of that leg. <clears throat> if you look at the top of the leg, <clears throat> so it certainly is some edema and we see some discoloration. Um, and somebody said seeping of fluid, maybe a few drops of fluid. So what we see is that this extremity is large, it's edematous, it's swollen, so we know there's too much fluid in these interstitial spaces. And so, um, you know, we want to have the patient have a fever, whatever that might be. But the patient has this discoloration around the top of the leg, and that might be, it's hard to tell without looking at the entire leg. The patient might have some chronic venous insufficiency. So we want to know how long has the leg look like this? Has it been a short amount of time or has that been sort of chronic that this has happened? How long does it look like this before the patient called us to go to the hospital? So one of the things is this leg at risk for. So this patient's leg is really at risk for, this skin is really fragile. 
So we want to be really careful with this leg and not put a lot of pressure on the skin of this leg because we can actually tear it a little bit. So do you want this patient walking a long way to your stretcher? Anybody want that? Mm, yeah, me, no, probably not. So the patient infection and DVT might be two completely different things. Can the patient have both? Sure, why not? I always like it when patients have lots of things wrong with them. So you want to protect this leg, right? The leg's going to be heavy, right? The patient may not be able to walk properly. We're not going to spend a lot of time trying to put on the shoes and socks, right? We are just like not doing that. So we want to protect this. What do you think about the color of this foot? I think it's good, bad, or sort of indifferent. So the skin looks a little bit waxy. I don't think that, honestly, I don't think the color looks terrible. It looks a little, you know, it looks like there's some discoloration down there in that big toe. And I'm not quite sure what that is. I definitely want to look at the other one, right? It looks a little bit pale. What's the assessment that you want to do for color and perfusion in those toes? Any thoughts? It's pretty easy. We're absolutely doing capillary refill, absolutely doing capillary refill. And I'm pretty obsessive. I'm going to do capillary refill on every single one of those toes because I like to know. And so I might compare that with the capillary refill that I get in the hand of that patient. So there are a lot of things going on with this foot. And so I want you to think back to your experience. Yeah, motor and sensory are really important, especially in our diabetic patients. This patient if it's a diabetic may not even be able to feel these toes. So we're gonna look at one leg and we're gonna look at the other. This looks like chronic issues in this left leg to me. Is it likely this patient has similar issues in the right leg? Absolutely. So depending on how this, why this patient called us, you know, we really wanna think about that. So we want this leg at least flat, maybe a little bit elevated um, in the stretcher and be really careful. You know, our new striker frames have like a hundred seat belts on them. I want to be really careful of this patient with those lower straps that are going to go over these legs because I don't want to injure this skin any more than it already is. So be, I know we want to, re, you know, keep our patients seat belted in, but this is not the patient who needs really tight seat belt control over those legs. You can really damage that skin and you can do that quickly in a patient. So be careful about doing that. So I love this slide. We'll talk a little bit, well, what happens when that blood clot breaks off and it moves? So we already said it's going to go up the vena cava, right? Through the right side of the heart and maybe track out to the pulmonary vasculature. So we're thinking in pul pulmonary ventilation, perfusion. If our patient has a blood clot stuck in, oh, in the pulmonary vasculature, what else are you worried about right away? Might be your presenting symptom, why they called you. What would that be? What are some things you're really worried about? Yeah, this is a patient who has this leg thing, but now is calling you because of this acute shortness of breath. So I really like this slide. Because, yeah, shortness of breath, hypoxia, and dyspnea on exertion. Exactly correct. So this is a great slide because it, we're just going to take a step back and review what happens here, right? So this blood clot is moving and it's traveling in the venous blood. It's going to in the capillary bed and the pulmonary system and it gets stuck. So what is that? Is that a ventilation or perfusion problem? If I could give extra bonus credits, I would, but so is that ventilation or perfusion? <clears throat> So this is a perfusion problem, right? There's nothing wrong with this lung. The problem is that there's a blood clot stuck in this pulmonary vasculature. The, the, um, the, the ventilation issue, I love this one, I'm teaching my new students, is that uh, you know the one over here on the left side of the slide is the patient who maybe swallowed or inhaled that peanut and the peanut gets stuck in her bronchus. So now that lung is not expanding well. That is a ventilation issue. So when we talk about a PE or any kind of a venous thrombus that is moving and becomes a pulmonary embolus, we have this blood clot that's stuck in the pulmonary vasculature. And we've talked a lot about legs, but I want to caution you that patients can have um, phlebitis from, in an arm from a catheter device, which is why in hospital we frequently change IVs every few days because we don't want our patients developing 
a, 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 thromb, a phlebitis or a thrombophlebitis even in an arm. So look everywhere for these things, right? So, okay, so can we treat that in the field? Well, probably not, right? We're not gonna anticoagulate somebody in the field for suspected PE. We wanna be really sure that we relay all the information we can about our assessment. Hey, so, Nikki, I, so you have a question? Can you no? go back a slide? Oh, that one? Or that, that one? one? No, that, the pulmonary embolism, yeah. That one there? So I just wanted to point out that the examples are backwards. So. Right. So if you have a foreign body in the bronchus, that lung is ventilated, that lung is perfused, but oh, not sorry. ventilated. No worries. I just didn't want you said it correctly, but I didn't want people to get confused by reading the slide. I wonder why it's that way. I wonder if there's some way I could have flipped that around. Well, anyway, yeah, you're right. But you said it right. Yeah. Well, thank goodness for that, right? So so this is a great picture of what a blood clot might look like while it gets stuck in that pulmonary vasculature. So, um, and that, you know, we think of, a, if I think of a clot, I think of a tiny little thing, but this is a long stringy blood clot. And so it's gonna, um, it's gonna cause some big problems wherever it is stuck and a patient's gonna need some real diagnostics to look at the extent of, of what that is. So we might have some obstruction um, uh, and, and some real problems as a result of this pulmonary embolism. Maybe maybe some infarction. We we don't know, right? We can't tell. Our patients can present to us with the shortness of breath and the dyspnea on exertion, and uh, we're going to look for you know those kinds of issues and present. So if we have a patient with PE, I just put kind of the schematics for those things that um, that we might think about, right? This breathlessness, maybe some pleuritic uh, pain in the chest that is worse when the patient takes a breath. Um, maybe some uh, fever, cough with blood shriek sputum. If a patient has a massive emboli, maybe we would see some uh, um, uh, cardiovascular collapse. It's really hard to say, right, without knowing just how much that patient has. Over on the right side, when we talk about that clinical or the diagnosis and treatment, we're not doing any of those things in the field, right? But we want to relay that patient's uh, condition, certainly, but that patient needs some rapid uh, assessment, intervention, and treatment. And so, let me try to move my screen a little bit. So, when we talk about prevention, I, I left that in here to talk about this because our patients who have had a PE or had, you know, those uh, a PE or is it really a risk for PE, maybe at home with some of these prevention mechanisms, right? The first one might be anticoagulation. Maybe that patient is at home on warfarin or some other drug to keep the patient from developing a blood clot. The patient may tell you that they've had insertion of a vena cava filter. They may be wearing some sort of compression stockings. Um, probably wouldn't have those pneumatic compression boots at home, but might have them in a facility if you're transporting from one to the other. So you want to know, you know, if your patient is on these things, well, why do you want it? Well, I had a PE in the past, and that really makes them a little bit higher risk. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, 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 some additional assessment. So, you know, if we have the ability to look at electrocardiogram, we can look for other things that I don't know how to look for, like RV strain. Somebody who knows how to do that is going to do that. We we'll look for new, new issues, new AFib, new... Um, new bundle branch block and those kinds of things. We're really looking for vitals, right? We're looking for hypoxia. We're looking for breast sounds and what our breast sounds might sound like if they're abnormal. But if our patient has real shortness of breath, you know, we're, we really want to be diligent about that pulmonary assessment. So we're just looking at a patient, a patient uh, scenario. Um, I sort of embellished it a little bit there. This is actually a patient that I had, uh, I want to say like 15 years ago now. Anyway, Hey, you're dispatched for a 50-year-old patient with shortness of breath. You know, that could be anything, right? Discharged one week ago from rehab where the patient had a total right knee replacement. What are you thinking, right? Total right knee replacement. Patient's supposed to be doing exercises and that sort of thing. Patient reports he's not taking his prescribed post-operative aspirin. Why would a patient be taking aspirin after having orthopedic surgery? Any thoughts? What is aspirin? 
Yeah, to prevent a clot. So aspirin is an anti-platelet agent. So its job is to keep those platelets from sticking together and causing just what we do not want. And that is um, um, a blood clot in the leg. So the patient was at home. He was kind of the couch potato sitting on the couch for many hours for the last few days. But then he had to get up and go to the bathroom. It's usually a defining moment. Gets up, walks to the bathroom, and now your patient has this bad chest pain and that and shortness of breath. So that's why he's calling. Awake alert times four. We like that. Patient is anxious. Skin is pale, diaphoretic, chest pain, seven out of 10. So what are, you're probably thinking a whole bunch of things with that, right? Dyspnea and orthopnea. What's orthopnea? Yeah, so he's having trouble breathing when he's. Um, lying down, can't lie. Yeah, exactly. Unable to lie down. He's sitting in this high fowler position in his chair. You look at his knee incision because everybody's thinking knee, this knee problem, right? And you don't see anything wrong with this knee, right? It's well approximated incision. There's no draining. But then you look at the left leg. Oh my goodness. His left leg is larger than his right leg. There's an area behind the leg that's reddened. He's got hitting edema to the entire lower left leg, and he has pain and tenderness in the popliteal area. Is that a problem for you? Which is the problem? Is it the knee leg or is it the other leg? Yeah, the problem is the other leg, right? So don't get diverted by because the patient has this huge incision on the leg. Pulse ox is 80%. Good, bad? We're worried about that, right? We don't like that. Um, think about what you're going to do with that for a minute. Blood pressure of 96 over 60 for a 50-year-old post-op patient. Yeah, I don't think that's good. Heart rate, we know that heart rate is too fast. The rhythm is regular. Well, thank goodness for that, right? Respiratory rate is 28 and shallow. What do you think happened to this person? And do you need ALS? Thank you for, uh, for that. You always want to go in and think about what we need. You're a BLS crew. Do you need ALS? Yeah, for sure. Think of one differential diagnosis you need to think about with this patient. You're thinking on DVT because you just came to this class. Yeah, you cannot rule out that this patient's having an MI, can you? You can't, you cannot rule that out. So we can put two and two together. So we really need to worry about that on this. And so we need our ALS providers to come take care of this patient. We need IV access to this patient. Look at that EKG. Uh, what kind of priority do you think this patient might be? Because you know, we always need to figure that one out, right? What's your priority? I think thinking this is a priority one patient, right? It's a chest pain. It's an anxious patient. The blood pressure is low. The pulse ox is low. Bad things are happening with this patient. Are you going to consult for this patient? Everybody better say yes, for sure, right? And so this was actually a patient that I had and uh, I got him, um, I was in the critical care unit and got this patient and he actually had not one PE, he had 18 of them. He had 18 PEs. And so 18 PEs was sort of mind boggling for me. He's like, how does that happen? And we were a small rural hospital. Oh my goodness. So we kept him sitting in that high Fowler's position, you know, oxygen treating him. And then we transferred him to a tertiary facility 20 miles up the road. So 18 PE. So just because you think a patient through a blood clot, if patients are high risk, they can have more than one. And of course, our critical patients can have lots of things going on with them. So I just want to take you back to our, our stress hormone slide. You think this patient is having maybe more stress hormone? released? The answer to that would be, that's a yes or a no. Yeah, for sure. Um, more stress hormone, blood sugar might be up, heart rate up, all these things as a result of this really stressful scenario. Probably your heart rate's up a little bit too. So I love this next picture because it, we can't help but talk. Um, maybe I'm diverging a little bit, but I can't help myself. Because we're talking about these bad venous problems. And we see this patient, I, I, this might be that patient, the top part of that leg. So what is this? That's a bad venous stasis ulcer here. So this might be the drippy patient. I had this patient a few weeks ago. All the clothing was saturated. 
We're looking for poles, you know, pus everywhere. Absolutely, we're looking for everything that can cause this patient to maybe have a DVT, maybe some cellulitis if there's pus in here. Absolutely, there's an infection risk, but the point about showing you this slide, you want to look at both legs because this disease is in probably both legs. Suspect other circulatory issues, capillary refill, of course, you know, pulse sensation, all that. Are you going to put your lower leg straps over this leg? Please tell me. My answer would be, please say, what's everybody going to say? Leg strap over this leg. Please don't do that. You can really cause a lot of damage to that. So please don't do that. So, so here's another one, another scenario. I just had this patient a little while ago. Uh, single family residence, and you were met at the door by this patient, male patient, about 70 years old, I don't remember. Lives alone, gets occasional home support, so he can't do much. Um, patient is obese, has clearly difficult walking. That leg that I just showed you, this leg here, Imagine that that patient has twice as much venous stasis ulcer and they are on both legs. Can you all envision that? And the one on the right leg has like yellow pus draining out of it and it's everywhere. There's one four by four that's sort of covering this, but the pus is everywhere and there's fluid everywhere. So you walk into the kitchen, there's a lot of clutter. You know what the house looks like, right? Um, proceeds to show you both legs. And this patient has edema from the feet all the way up to the groin in both legs. So are you walking that patient out? Well, uh, <clears throat> so you need to think really carefully about what you're going to do with this patient and how easy it is to even get that patient out. Remember, the patient walked to the door but we're worried about a lot of things in the patient, history of chronic venous insufficiency, which is now way out of control, cardiac history, and my hypertension, type 2 diabetes. What do you think his blood sugar is going to be? Oh, I tell you what it is. Ah, yeah, yeah, it's high, right? And that, so we don't know how he's managing his blood pressure or blood sugar. Temp is 100.4. Is that high, low, or normal? Yeah, it's high, right? So we're worried this patient might have a source of sepsis. I actually asked this patient about the feet because the feet look the both look so bad. The patient actually reported he hasn't been able to see his feet in years. Oh my goodness. So we were really concerned about that. So the patient was this patient was pretty stable, respiratory at 20. I wasn't real worried about that. I sort of expected the 110 um, and uh, and uh, the blood pressure, you know, I'm not terribly worried about that. So we need to, he also needs, you know, certainly a sepsis uh, workup, maybe at the hospital. And um, we really are concerned about that home environment, right? So does he have enough resources at home? So I probably talked a lot a too lot about that. But anyway, so we have some resources. That's really um, sort of the end of our conversation this evening. Anybody have any thoughts or anything you want to talk about more? File a CARES report, absolutely. <clears throat> so you might get a medical box if you need an engine to help get him out of the house. Absolutely, you might need to be able to do that. And this is an ambulatory patient, yeah, for sure. But so there's a lot of things to be able to consider with this patient. Um, um, so I put some resources out there where I got most of these these um, these references. So you're welcome to look for those. But what a anyway. fun review, you guys! Thank you so much. So somebody asked about a saline wrap. So I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna do a saline. Uh, probably not gonna do a saline wrap with this patient. I don't want it to be cold, but um, but I'm certainly gonna try and and put some kind of dressing. On that particular patient, a trauma dressing was great. Trauma dressings are big and they're bulky. We need to put them on there. I'm not doing a circular wrapping because I really want to show it to the nurses when I get to the hospital and say, look at this leg. Somebody needs to see this leg. This patient needs a wound ostomy or console to take care of this long-standing problem. So absolutely. Don't cover it up. So you want to share that in your verbal report. So 
Thanks everybody for your kind attention and you've been very uh, cooperative with responding to us. We really appreciate that. Assess a responsive group. Right. Any, any other questions? Great. Thanks everybody for 